Hey, all right. Welcome to Mountain Springs this morning. It's good to be with you all. My name is Bobby. I'm the pastor of worship and engagement here at Mountain Springs. And if this is your first time here, we're so glad that you decided to join us this morning. Like Amy just said, we're in the middle, right in the middle of a series called Heart for the City. And I think this is such an important series for us as a church because here at Mountain Springs, we're all about transforming lives from neighborhoods to the nations by the power of God's love. And that begins with us having a heart for our city, a heart for Colorado Springs, a heart for the people around us. Over the past two weeks, Pastor Daniel's been really leading us towards loving where we live. That means we love the place where we live. We love Colorado Springs. Like, I don't know about you, but for, for me, like, that's an easy one. I just look west. I see the mountains. We're going to have a good day today. Like, Colorado Springs, that's easy. The second part, we still, we love our city. That means we love the people. We actively love the people. We love Colorado Springs. It's not just something that we should do. It's not just something that we can do, but it's actually something that the Lord has invited us to do, something that he has called us to do. We are to love our city. So if you've missed one of those messages, I just encourage you, go back, listen, find it on the podcast because as the church, we're not separated from the city that we're a part of. We're not separated from the pain in it and we're not separated from the joy in it but we're actually called to be a part of it, to be involved, to participate in it. So as we get going this morning, uh, I just wanna tie back to a verse from Jeremiah 29. Uh, Daniel's been taking us through Jeremiah 29. And I just wanna look at verse seven to kind of set up where we're going this morning. It says, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Another translation, another version of that same verse says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city. You might remember uh, Daniel saying, we, we pray for the shalom of our city. We pray for the shalom, the peace of our city. And this is saying that we can't say that we have a heart for our city and then not be involved in the community around it. We have to be involved. We have to care. We have to love where we live. And in order to truly love where we live, I believe that we have to have a heart of generosity. We have to be a generous people. And that's what we're really gonna look at today. So let's pray together and then we're gonna dig in. Jesus, we love you. Thank you that we can come together, that we can dig into your word and that we can hear you speak to us corporately and individually. And so Lord, we invite you to move in this place this morning. We love you. We worship you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, when I was 17 years old, it was time for me to make a big move in my life. I was going to be moving away from my hometown of Waynesville, Illinois, and I was going to be moving to downtown Chicago. Now, Here's what happens when you say, yeah, like I grew up in Illinois. People say, oh, Chicago, because people think like Illinois is only Chicago. But I, can, I promise you it's not. There's a lot more than just Chicago. There's some great rural farming communities throughout Illinois, and that's where I grew up. A town of 500 people right in the middle of the state, and I loved it. I loved the way that I grew up. And my family was a part of a church there. And on my last Sunday before I was moving away, I'm at church, when the service is over, this older couple comes up to me. They put a hundred dollar bill in my hand. Now, <laughs> I was 17. So instantly I thought, we're going for pizza tonight because I got money in my pocket and I'm hungry, right? Because I'm 17, I'm always hungry. So here's what they did. They came up, they put a hundred dollar bill in my hand. They said, we love you. They said, we're so proud of you. They said, you're taking steps towards becoming the person that God has created you to be. And we want to be a part of the story. We want you to know that you matter. And they hugged me and they walked away. Well, every time I would come back home for a break, they'd come up to me, they'd put money in my hand. They'd tell me that I mattered to them and that I mattered to God. Now, could they have done that and not given me anything? Of course. 
Would that still have been important in my life? Of course. But here's the thing. Because of their generosity, the message actually stuck. So here we are over 20 years later, and I still remember. And here we are over 20 years later, and I still believe them. Because generosity is love in action. And here's what I know about generosity. (laughs) And I think you'll agree with this. We like when people are generous to us. (laughs) We like to be on the receiving end of generosity. Who doesn't like it? When you go out for dinner, you finish your meal, you see the waiter coming up, they got the dessert tray in their hand, they put it down and they say, hey, this one's on us tonight. (laughs) Right, like we like when people are generous to us. I also think that we, generally speaking, want to be a generous people. We want, we want to be generous. We have intentions of being generous, but sometimes there can be some blocks in our life that actually keep us from living out our generosity. Like I want to give, but how can I give when, man, I'm barely making it as it is. I want to give, but how can I give when I'm in the middle of this divorce? I don't know what tomorrow's going to look like. I want to give, but how can I give when I'm trying to put all these kids through college. I want to give, but how can I give when I'm in college? Like I have nothing. I have nothing to give. I want to give, but you see, there can be a tension inside of all of us where we want to give, but we don't think we can. And that's really what brings us to the point of everything that we're going to talk about this morning. This is the point. The generosity is not about our money. But generosity is about our hearts. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 talks all about this tension. And that's one of the things that's so amazing about the Bible is that the tensions that we feel and experience today were also true for the people of Corinth 2,000 years ago. And Paul writes to them and he speaks to them about this very struggle. So if you have your devices, go ahead and open up the Mountain Springs app get to the message notes for the weekend. If you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Corinthians chapter eight. And while you're getting there, uh, let me just set up the backstory here. Let me set up what's happening in chapter eight. You see, Paul's writing to the Corinthians about their giving because they had made a commitment to give to the church in another region, the church back in Jerusalem, the church in Judea. There had been a famine in that area and the region of Judea had been hit particularly hard and they needed the support from the other believers in the area. And so Corinth had said, hey, we're all in. We're gonna help take care of the church. Luke actually tells us a little bit about that so we know that this is what was happening in uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 27. Let me just read this to you. It says, now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. Then parenthetically, it says, this took place in the days of Claudius. So it's saying it took place while Claudius was Caesar of Rome. The the famine happened. Verse 29 says, so the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So the Corinthians had made this commitment to give, but they didn't actually follow through with being generous. Like the tensions that we experience so often, we have a desire to give, but we have blocks that keep us from giving. This is where we are when we start with chapter eight, verse one, 2 Corinthians says, we want you to know brothers about the grace of God that's been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Okay, so what's happening here? Paul is writing to the Corinthians, but he begins chapter eight with sharing about churches in another region. 
the region of Macedonia because they had made the same commitment to give. But unlike the Corinthians, they followed through on their giving. And so that's what Paul's doing as he writes this part of the letter. And he begins by saying, we want you to know. And that's an important phrase right there at the beginning because he's saying, hey guys, pay attention. Like you have to hear this. You're gonna want to hear this. We want you to know. He's trying to inspire the church in Corinth, much like I hope to inspire you today. He's saying, we want you to know. And then he goes on to say about the grace of God that's been given among the churches of Macedonia. Right at the beginning where he says the grace of God, we want you to know about the grace of God. He's talking about generosity because what he's saying is the generosity that we're gonna describe here, it's a grace gift from God. It's not natural. It's not something that they could do on their own. And we'll see that as we dig into the next few verses. But he's writing to the Corinthians and he's saying, I want you to hear all about the church in Macedonia and how they are giving by the Holy Spirit enabling their hearts to give. Now here's what's important. Paul's not writing this to shame them. He's not writing this to shame them, but he's trying to share a story of what could be saying, hey guys, here's what the churches in Macedonia are doing and you can do it too. And then he goes on to share about how they're giving. Verse two, it says, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Now, did you catch the words that are used there in that verse? Because there's some pretty, uh, there's some pretty challenging words used in verse two. They're very descriptive, what Paul's saying there. He's not being light about what's happening in the church because he says, hey, in a severe test of affliction, there's what? There was abundance of joy. And in extreme poverty, that overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Like those are serious words. Those are challenging words. It's not easy to have joy when we're facing tough situations. Right, like think about that for a minute. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like it's not, tr it's not easy for us to have joy when things aren't going our way. It's not easy for us to have joy when we experience loss. It's not easy for us to experience joy when we have a, a, a lost job or we have to relocate again or we have a health scare or our kids are in the hospital. It's not easy to have joy when our marriage isn't making the expectation that we had in mind. It's not easy to have joy. And when I think about severe affliction, these are the kind of situations that I think about. Real problems for real people where it's not easy to just say, you know what, I'm gonna think positive, I'm gonna hope for the best and everything's gonna be okay. These are situations where it's not easy to find joy. It's not natural to have joy in times of affliction. It's supernatural. It's something that the Holy Spirit can do inside of us. And if you're in one of those seasons right now, if you're in one of those situations right now, we want you to know that you are not alone, that we stand with you, that we pray for you, that you're not alone. And we recently went through a series called Hope in the Dark. Go listen to that. Listen to that series and know that there is hope in the dark. There is hope in times of affliction. And this is what Paul's talking about here. He's saying the Macedonian church is going through some real stuff, yet somehow they have this abundance of joy. They're also living in extreme poverty, yet it's overflowing in a wealth of generosity. And where it says extreme poverty, it's like you can imagine there's a barrel and the barrel is empty all the way down to the bottom. And you go to the bottom and there's nothing left. You can't go any deeper. The poverty is so deep that is, Paul's saying they have nothing. Yet they were so generous. In our culture, I think it's hard to understand poverty like that. We don't see it every day in our everyday life. We don't see poverty that's all the way down at the bottom. Like it can kind of look like this for us. I don't know about you, but it can look like this for me. 
I've got, I, you know, I've got uh, my iPhone 8 and uh, the camera. I don't know if you guys know this, but the camera on the iPhone 8, it's no good. <laughs> and so like my Instagram story, it's also no good. Uh, I should probably just like get rid of Instagram because I really need the iPhone 11 because it's got a killer camera, but money's, money's tight. <laughs> Times are hard right now. <laughs> Sometimes we get mixed up in our mind what it is to have and what it is to have not. And we don't understand deep poverty. And what Paul's saying here is that the church was experiencing deep poverty, yet it was overflowing in this wealth of generosity. And I think it's so interesting that Paul ties these situations together where he says there was affliction and joy. And then there was poverty and generosity because what that begins to show us is that generosity is not about our money. It's about our hearts. Because it's impossible for us to have true joy in times of true pressure without the Holy Spirit doing something inside of us. In the same way, it's impossible for us to live truly generous lives, whether we have money or we don't, without the Holy Spirit doing something inside of us. But here's the thing. When we give our lives to Jesus, that work in our heart is already beginning. And now it becomes our responsibility. It becomes our responsibility to say, how can I respond? Verse three and four goes on to tell us more about what their generosity looked like. It says, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Now this is wild. Because what he's saying is, look, they gave what was reasonable for their situation. They gave what was reasonable. But then somehow they gave beyond what was reasonable. They gave more than what they had. I don't even know how that works, but they gave more than what they had. And then this is where it really takes a turn because it says, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Now this is completely backwards from what I would expect. Because if I'm looking at Paul, and Paul's coming to Macedonia to raise money for the church in Judea. This is how I would see it going. Paul comes, he's got a couple stories about the pain and the suffering of the church in Jerusalem. Then he shares a cool video. It's got a couple sad puppies in the background because that really tugs at the heartstrings. There's got to be a Sarah McLaughlin track playing because you cannot raise money without Sarah McLaughlin. And then when the video's over, he comes forward. He makes that big request. He says, guys, would you please give to the cause? That's not what Paul describes here. He describes the complete opposite. And this is how we know that their generosity was a grace gift from God. Because even though they were poor, even though they had nothing, this is how they responded. They said, Paul, how can we give? Paul, how can we contribute? We want to give to the cause. Listen, leave the video at home. We don't even really like Sarah McLaughlin that much anyway. We just want to give and we want to be a part of this story. How can we give? And I'm telling you guys, that's not normal. That's not normal. But when something or someone begins to get a hold of our hearts, our hands begin to let go of our money. You see, they weren't just giving to Paul. They wanted to give to the relief of the saints in Jerusalem. Their hearts were broken for those that were hurting and it drove them to action. Because we give to the things that break our hearts and we give to the things that have our hearts. And I think this has really become more evident in recent years. As you look at social media, this is one of the really great things about social media is that we can see things like GoFundMe. We can see needs that are out there and we can see people respond generously to those needs. But Rachel and I have some friends in Kansas City. And a couple of years ago, the dad and their three kids, they're driving to school, normal, normal, mon uh, normal morning routine just driving to school, and they were sideswiped. They ran into a light pole. They were in a very serious accident. 
And their middle daughter, who was in the accident that morning, who was eight years old, went to be with Jesus. And their youngest daughter, she had some serious life-threatening injuries. So she was in the hospital. And her mom and dad battled and battled and battled in the place of prayer for her, along with other people all over the world. And that little girl battled and battled and battled for her life. And after several months, she was actually able to be released from the hospital and she was able to go home. But she's paralyzed from the chest down. And so she's in a motorized wheelchair. The new reality for that family, the new reality for that little girl. So a couple months ago, they posted a need on Facebook that says, hey, she needs a new wheelchair. She needs a different kind of wheelchair. And it's gonna be thousands and thousands of dollars, as you might imagine. But people's hearts were broken for this family. People's hearts were broken for this little girl and it drove them to action. So within 24 hours, they had every dollar that they needed for the new wheelchair. And they were able to order it and purchase it. And just a couple weeks ago, they posted a video of the wheelchair arriving and the little girl seeing it for the first time. And the expression on her face, the smile on her face, it was just incredible. And every person that gave, every person that gave is a part of that smile. Because generosity connects our story to those that we're generous to. What a blessing to the family, but also what a blessing to give. We give to the things that break our hearts and we give to the things that have our hearts. So the question for us today is we're in this series called Heart for the City. The question for us today is, does your heart break for our city? Does your heart break for Colorado Springs? Does your heart break for your neighbor? Does your heart break for the single mom who lives down the street, who's trying to work full time, trying to file ch find childcare full time, and she doesn't know where to turn? Does your heart break for that person? Does your heart break for the food insecure in our town? Does your heart break for the suicide rate in El Paso County? Does your heart break for the person that doesn't know Jesus, that doesn't know there's an answer? Does your heart break for that person? So recently, I've been finding myself praying this prayer, God, would you break my heart for what breaks your heart? While I'm driving through the streets of our community, God, would you break my heart for what breaks your heart? Over our neighborhoods, over our schools, God, would you break my heart for what breaks your heart? Sometimes it's like we, we wanna go through life with some blinders on our eyes. We don't wanna see the pain that's around us. We wanna pretend like it doesn't exist because it's easier. It's easier just to pretend that everything is fine. But guys, it's not fine. It's not fine. Recently, I had the opportunity to sit down with a local elementary school principal, with a school very close to here. And I wanted to ask him what he sees about our community through the lives of his students because he would have a perspective that I don't have. He would have a perspective that a lot of us in the room might not have. Some of us see that, but not all of us. As I asked the question, tears immediately began to well up in his eyes. As he said, man, there's so much pain in our community. I see so much pain in our students. There's kids who are coming to school, they don't have clean clothes. There's kids who are coming to school, they don't have a proper lunch. Sometimes they don't have any lunch at all. There's kids whose parents are going through a divorce. And now the, the, the student's just trying to figure out how they fit in life now. There's kids who are acting out with anger issues because that's what they see at home. That's what's demonstrated at home and that's all they know. And then he paused for a minute. And he said, and then there's this seven-year-old boy who's having suicidal thoughts and he's ready to end it all. The guy's seven years old. <laughs> That's not okay. 
That's not okay in our town. That's not okay in our city. That's not okay in our schools. And the principal said, sometimes I feel like the struggle is so great that I don't know what to do and I don't know where to turn. Guys, that breaks my heart. Does it break your heart? This is our town. These are our neighbors. These are our coworkers. Does it break your heart? And the principal is actually a believer, which is incredible. And so we took the time to pray together and pray for the students, to pray for the school, to pray for those families. And then we began to dream of what could be if the church came together, what could the new reality for that school or for those families or for our communities be if the church came together with open hearts and open hands? We began to dream of what could be because this is our town. This is our watch. And generosity is fuel for change. Generosity is love in action. And generosity is not about our money. It's about our hearts. If we jump back into our text, we get the real key to the Macedonians and their ability to give. This is the key. Verse five, it says, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. We give to the things that break our hearts and we give to the things that have our hearts. And the Lord had their heart. When the Lord has our heart, we begin to see just how generous he's been to us. That everything that we have is a gift from him. And that if he's asking us to give, that he's the one that enables us to give and that we could never outgive God. We can never outgive God. When I was a kid, I used to ride with my dad to go pick up his paycheck. Uh, you may be saying like, why would you have to go pick up the paycheck? <laughs> well, it was a different time. <laughs> we, would go pick up, we would go pick up his paycheck. My dad worked in a factory and there were seasons of our life where he was on strike or he was laid off and times were tight. We didn't have a lot of extra. And in those times we'd have to drive and we'd have to pick up his check. And so I'd ride with him, some good dad-son bonding time, right? We'd pick up his check, we'd go to the bank, and when he was cashing it, he would ask for it to be broken up a certain way. We'd walk back out to the truck, get in, and every time, without fail, my dad would pull out his wallet, he'd take the envelope of cash, and then he'd pull out a certain amount. He'd look at me, and he would say, this is our tithe. I'm putting it in a separate part of my wallet because I don't want to accidentally spend it. And I'm doing it right now because I want it to be the first thing that we do with our money. Because God has called us to be a generous family. And he has always been faithful to take care of us. And so this is our tithe. I want you to see it. I want you to know what we're doing. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. God, I, I can't tell you how many times I saw my dad do that. I can't tell you, he did it so many times. And I am so thankful for the example that I had for my dad teaching me to trust Jesus with my finances. And I'm so thankful for Rachel in the growing up experience that she had with her mom, where her mom demonstrated generosity in just incredible ways. Because we bring that together and now we get to live generous lives and we get to teach our kids how to be generous and we get to teach them the impact that that can have on lives around us. So grateful. So what about you? You know, there's a, I'm, I'm so inspired to hear about the generosity that comes through you. Generosity to missions, to your neighborhoods, to your schools. And for those of you who give regularly here at Mountain Springs, it's an honor to be able to partner with you to make a difference in our city. But I also know there's some of us in the room who've never taken that step to trust God with our finances. And I would just say this morning, now is a great time to start. Generosity isn't something that we want from you. It's something that we want for you because it's a blessing to give. And when we give, it ties our story to those that we're generous to. So take a step. Take a step. Even this week, when you go out for dinner, like leave a bigger tip. <laughs> leave a bigger tip. Whether the waiter deserves it or not, 
leave a bigger tip than you normally would. When you go through Starbucks, you're in the drive-thru, pay for the person behind you. Now, I do this. And what you have to understand is that I'm a black coffee guy. So I get like the cheapest thing on the menu. And without fail, the person behind me, they get the biggest, most sugary, most expensive drink on the menu. And I gotta tell you, there's a little bit in me that just goes, why wouldn't you just get black coffee? <laughs> right, you know what I'm talking about here. But I can tell you, when you drive away and you know that you've made a little dent in somebody's day to make it better, man, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. And maybe there's some of you in the room who've never uh, given back to the Lord through the local church. And I just want to invite you to consider beginning that, to consider beginning generosity in that way. I know it can feel like a struggle. And if times are, tar- times are tight, just start, start small. But be consistent, be regular. Because we'll never regret being generous. We'll never regret it. Andy Stanley says, rich people aren't generous. Generous people are generous. Isn't that good? Rich people aren't generous, but generous people are generous. So this is for all of us in the room, whether we have a little or we have a lot. Begin to ask the Lord to open up your heart to something new. Begin to ask the Lord with that dangerous prayer, God, would you break my heart for what breaks your heart? Because I'm telling you, Colorado Springs wouldn't be the same. Just imagine, just imagine what could be in our city. Imagine what could be in our community. Last Christmas, I read a story about a church in Texas that heard that their school district had a need with unpaid lunch accounts. So they had unpaid lunches and debt in their schools. So they decided to take their Christmas Eve offering and they gave it all away to the school district to pay that school debt, $10,000. Now the year before they had done the same thing with their sister school. They paid off that individual school's lunch debt. That was like $1,800. But once they saw the impact that it had on the families in their community, they said, this year we're going big. And they took on the entire district. 10,000 people, and that's a church, or $10,000, and that's a church of 200 people. 200 people. It's incredible. The pastor said, if the church does not impact the community the church is in, then the church is not doing its job. If the church does not impact the community the church is in, and the church is not doing its job. Guys, imagine what could be. I read the story of another church in central Missouri. They had recognized that hospital debt was a major issue in their region. Over 70% of bankruptcies that were filed in that area were due to medical debt. And the issue is really twofold, because hospitals have to provide care whether a person can pay or not. And so because of that, they were actually falling apart because they couldn't pay their bills. And over the past five years, six hospitals in that area closed, three of them within the last year. Can you imagine the negative impact that that would have on a community? The jobs that were lost, the resources that were no longer available. This church has a strong commitment to provide care for the spiritual needs and the physical needs of their community. And so they took action. They partnered with a nonprofit that could pay off medical debt for pennies on the dollar. And then they took off to raise as much money as they could. Now the pastor, he thought, wouldn't it be great if we could raise like 10 or $20,000? We'd be able to pay off $200,000 of medical debt. Wouldn't that be great? But we give to the things that break our hearts and people's hearts were broken. And within 10 days, they raised $430,000 and were able to erase $43 million of medical debt in central Missouri, which directly impacted the lives of 10,000 people. And that number is still growing. Guys, imagine what could be. 
Imagine what could be if our hearts were broken and our hands were open in Falcon. Imagine what could be if our hearts were broken and our hands were open in Briargate. Imagine what could be that Peterson and Fort Carson, if our hearts were broken and our hands were open. Imagine what Colorado Springs could be when the church comes together and lives with open hands. It cannot stay the same. Because the Holy Spirit uses you. The Holy Spirit uses me to fuel change in our city. And it comes through the generosity of believers. Guys, does your heart break for our city? Will you stand with me? Just imagine what could be. Begin to say that prayer. God, would you break my heart for what breaks yours? Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. We love you. Thank you for your generosity in our lives. God, you have been so good to us. And so Lord, we ask you to speak to us now in this moment. God, that this afternoon would not be the same in our lives, that we would see our city from a new perspective, that we would see our city with your eyes. And God, that we would be driven to action. God, would you break our hearts for the things that break yours. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're gonna-